and beauty, a spiritual perspective on sustainability. Unless we can lead sustainable lives, there is no way we can make our planet sustainable. So while we might try to use new technologies, shift away from fossil fuels, unless we look at how we are consuming our own planet, then no solution can be lasting. Yeah, I grew up in Delhi, which is a large uh, metropolis, but I was lucky that where I lived, uh, where I spent my childhood, uh, there was a small wooded area in the northern ridge, a little wood, a little green oasis, and I used to go and uh, do morning walks there. I was still a child. And there was a little pond there, hmm? a little pond. Uh, and I'm sure as children, uh, you played by the pond, uh, you throw a little pebble into the pond, and if you throw a pebble in the pond, there are ripples, nice, circular, perfect ripples, which ripple through the pond, then the water settles, and then you throw another pebble, again you see the waves play, and that used to be something I loved to do in my morning walks. And much later, uh, recalling this spiritual moment, if you like, this moment of beauty, I wrote a little poem, which I'd like to share with you. The poem is called Pebbles. Pebbles. Here is how it goes. Come throw a pebble in the well of my being. Come throw a pebble in the well of my being. So I might see the ripples in your eyes, and the waves in your smile. So I might see the ripples in your eyes and the waves in your smile. Let me throw some pebbles too. Let me throw some pebbles too. So we may both hear echoes from far away of songs pebbled this day. Let me throw some pebbles too. So we may both hear Echoes from far away of songs pebbled this day. Come, bathe in me, drink of me, worship me. Come, bathe in me, drink of me, worship me. My waters are your waters. My waters are your waters. And all my pebbles are the ones you threw to proclaim I am you. And all my pebbles are the ones you threw to proclaim I am you. Come, throw a pebble. In an age where we often throw stones at each other, we throw stones physically, verbally, through our glances, in our communities, can happen amongst our colleagues. Let's go back to throwing pebbles, as we did in our childhood. Let's live in truth and beauty. You know, Sabarmati, which is my favorite place in Ahmedabad, not far away. Uh, if you go there, you find eternal peace. Just walking into that place, you find eternal peace. And this is what the Mahatma said long ago, much before sustainability and much before COP debates were taking place. His famous statement, there is enough in the world for everybody's need, not enough for everybody's greed. There is enough in the world for everybody's need, not enough for everybody's greed. What's the difference between need and greed? Anything beyond our needs is greed. Anything that we genuinely don't need is greed. So what do we need? Do we know what we need? You know, there's this great Buddhist uh, fable where a man is sitting on a horse and the horse is galloping away, very furiously galloping away. So someone calls out to him, uh, why are you in such a hurry? Where are you going? You know, you're on a horse, it's galloping away. He says, don't ask me, ask the horse. Don't ask me, ask the horse. So do we need what we want? Do we need? Do we know what we want? 
Or is it just because somebody is marketing it to you through social media, through clever advertisements? So much of our consumption is no longer physiological. It's not for the body. It is mental. It's symbolic. Luxury consumption, brands. So much of it is superfluous. So the real question we must ask, what do we really want? Anything we don't really want is just greed. So John Kenneth Galbraith, who was a famous economist at Harvard, he wrote a book in 1959. He called it The Affluent Society. And he said, in an affluent society, the problem is the distinction between need and want starts blurring. Needs are physiological. But wants are endless. They're of the mind. They're endless. And just because someone wants to sell something, wants to make a profit of it, then he sells that need to you. And that becomes a want. So what do we really need? We are a complex of four things. In fact, the Indian tradition would say three of those are unreal, the fourth is real. But even if you begin from the Western concept, there's the body, there's the mind, there's the heart. So the body has certain needs. We need nutrition, uh, we need warmth, we need shelter, we need security. Those are bodily needs. But to keep it fit, we need to exercise the body. Consuming is not enough. And you notice with all these dimensions, there's the consumption dimension, the consumer dimension, and there's the producer dimension. So the body consumes certain things, but unless you exercise it, yes, whether you go to the gym or you jog, yes, just consumption won't do it. Keep the right balance. And the body doesn't need much. How much food do you need to have your 2,000 calories? Not much. Very simple basic needs. And if you have nutritious food, fruit, raw vegetables, that's what they're saying now, right? Easily done. Nature abounds with those kind of nutritious fruits and vegetables. The mind. So the human being has a large brain. And with this brain, we can produce technology with which we can build houses, clothes. So all the bodily needs, the mind can help provide. It can build shelter, provide security. So that's one function of the mind. But there's another function of the mind, which is it needs its own food and drink. It needs its stimulation. The intelligent mind must flex its muscles. Just muscles need to be flexed. The mind must be exercised. You can play chess. You can do an MBA. You can do a startup. Yes. The mind, just like the body, needs exercise. Otherwise, it gets restless. So there's a consumption role, again, a production role. Exercise your mind. Emotions, the heart. The heart needs exercise, cardiovascular exercise, emotional exercise. We need love. We need to give love. Without love, the heart dries up. Love makes the world go round. So the heart has its own needs. Consumption, take love. Production, give love. Again, two roles. But the Indians said something, not just the Indians. I mean, a lot of people in the world, most religions, most philosophies, they said behind all that, there's something deeper. So behind the body, behind the mind, behind the soul, is something behind the heart, there's something which is the soul, the Atman, the spirit. And the spirit has its own needs. Yes, those needs are the needs which transcend those of the body, mind, and heart. Because the body, mind, and heart are transient. The body comes and goes. The soul is eternal. And the soul is one. It's not in multiplicity. There are lots of bodies, lots of minds. Lots of hearts. But underlying all that is the Advait spirit, the universal soul in which all these appear 
and all of these disappear. So, the soul has to be fed. And the food of the soul is truth and beauty. That's why Satyamev Jayate is our national motto. Satyam, Shivam, Sundaram. Truth and beauty. Unless we live in truth, unless we live in the beauty of goodness, which comes from love and sharing, then the soul remains hungry. You might satisfy the body, you might satisfy the mind, you might satisfy the emotions. The spirit still starves. So, unless you're established in truth and beauty, you are no longer really living. And here's a distinction I want us to clearly look at. I think a lot of uh, our own civilization and Western civilization, contemporary civilization, is confused between pleasure and joy. We often conflate these two things. We believe pleasure is the same thing as joy. They are almost entirely different. So what's the distinction between pleasure and joy? And are we a pleasure oriented civilization now? Or are we a joyful civilization now? So what's the distinction? Well, the first thing you'll notice, pleasure comes often from consuming things, passive consumption. Uh, watch some Netflix movie, uh, watch an IPL match, uh, eat a pizza. That is all fine, nothing wrong with that. But that cannot substitute for joy. If you want joy, go and play cricket. It may be bad cricket, doesn't matter. It may be barefoot. It may be in the lane. But watching an IPL match will give you pleasure. Play cricket will give you joy. So, pleasure, consumption. Joy from creation. And what do you create out of your four faculties? Body, mind, heart and soul. Exercise them. So exercise your body, exercise your mind, exercise your heart, exercise your soul. Then there's joy. Joy comes from creation. We are becoming a consumer-based society, a consumerist society. We think we can consume and be happy. We forget that most of the day, we are not there as consumers, we are there as producers. You come to the university as students. We people go to our jobs. So most of the day, we are in the role of producers, we are working. Only in the morning, in the breakfast, at night when we are having dinner, are we consumers. Maybe on a holiday we are consumers. Most of our life, waking life, is as producers. Which is why the Gita said, work is worship. Because it relies that unless there is joy in your role as creator, then the role as consumer is not going to be enough. It will not substitute. Pleasure will not substitute for joy. One comes from passive consumption. The other from active creation. Here is another distinction. Pleasure often comes from acquisition, from taking. Yes, and often then possession, domination. Joy comes from giving, sharing. Yes, so when you give a birthday gift to somebody, there is a feeling of joy. That is an act of giving. Yes, it is not necessarily an act of taking. So pleasure often comes from taking things and joy from giving things. This is something we've entirely forgotten in the discipline of economics, which is the basis of all social science today. Economics says, get the best bargain. Give out the least, take out the most. Might give you a lot of pleasure. A lot of people have great pleasure in bargaining. If you want to give joy, do a bad deal. Do a deal where you lose out something. It will make somebody else happy. So, joy from sharing and giving, pleasure from acquisition. If you think about it a little more deeply, what it means is joy is coming from the spirit, the soul part. While the pleasure is coming from the mind, the body and the heart, the physical part. And as we said, the spirit is one, while matter, mind, body, heart, the emotions, thoughts, yes, physical things, they are the multiplicity. So the Indian said, look, 
Advait. That the real us is one. There is one spirit. My own name Vivek comes from two words. Viv and Ek. Viv means Vivid, Vistar. Which means several. Ek means one. So what Vivek means, what looks several at the level of mind, body and heart is one at the level of spirit. And if we realize that, then we are established in joy. Otherwise, we are chasing matter. It's a materialistic world. It's a materialism pedagogy. Yes, then there's pleasure, not necessarily joy. And pleasure can never substitute for joy. Hence, Sat Chit Anand. Reality, consciousness, bliss. We need to be conscious of our deeper natures. The Buddha, when he sat under the tree and meditated as to the, what the world actually was, so he gave a noble eight-foot path, a shtang mark, which he said, this is the way to end suffering. The first of those eight paths was the right view, samdrishti, the right view. And what was his right view? He looked at his thoughts, his emotions, bodily sensations, and he realized all of these are ephemeral things. They're transient. They come and go. Thoughts come and go. Childhood had certain thoughts. Middle age, I'll have certain thoughts. Now you're having certain thoughts. Maybe you're already bored. Thoughts come and go. Emotions come and go. Angry in the morning. Peaceful in the afternoon. Restless in the evening. Sensations come and go. Pleasurable, unpleasurable. And the Buddha said, let them come and go. Don't make an identity out of them. Don't grasp them. Don't get attached to them. Don't make a self out of them.